Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, and MeWe. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. Looking for Belle? Uh, yeah. Hi! Hi. You looking for Karen? Hi. Hi. Really think it's a girl. So how's work? Any weirdos? Hi. How's your night? I want a baby too. I want a baby too. A little wobbly down there, huh? I know, I know. I'm sorry. Do you like drugs? Do you all get drug tested? Something that might uh, wake you up a bit. Want some blow? You want some blow? Never mind. Ha! Ah, you got this. Come on. What the fuck kind of drugs did you sell me? You can do this. Wait, no, 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 no! Stop! No! Fuck it! Stupid! You've been through worse. Are you are you laughing? Are you seriously fucking laughing right now? You think this is funny? Looking for this, I assume. Oh, oh yeah, thanks. I'm Sorry, some serious shit here. Sorry about that. Everything's cool. <laughs> ah, fuck you, stupid fucking prick! <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 481. Releasing November 29 on digital and video on demand is Dash, a one-take thriller that follows a rideshare driver's wild overnight shift in Hollywood in which his adulterous double-crossing life catches up with him. Impressive in its do-it-yourself filmmaking and thrilling in its white knuckle-tight storytelling, Dash is an engrossing one-take wonder that will take the viewer for a ride they will never forget. And joining me now is the director and writer of Dash, Mr. Sean Perry. Sean, I thank you so very much for your time today. Well, thank you for having me. It sounds like you should have wrote the film with that magnificent intro there. Wow. Well, thank you very much. You know, I was clearly inspired by after watching your movie. And, you know, what I really dug about Dash and, and what yourself and, you know, Alexander did with this, with this movie is that it really kind of uh, takes me back and, and, and reminds me of, you know, directors like Larry Cohen and, and Roger Corman, those kind of like do-it-yourself filmmakers. They were just like, it doesn't matter what backing we have. We're going to go out there. We're just going to make movies and we're going to make them and we're going to go into the streets and we're going to do these films. And it's almost kind of like a rebel filmmaking, right? And that's what uh, like Dash kind of reminds me of as well. What's really interesting is that the way that this film kind of came about is that you found yourself in Los Angeles. You had time. It's covid and you're just like, I'm not going to sit around and do nothing. I'm going to make a movie. Is that pretty much the kind of like the genesis of how it kind of came about? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, the year prior building up to COVID, Alex and I, the star and I, pitched around another film for around a year or so. And we just sat around and waited for somebody to say yes. And I come from that mentality of just going out and doing it yourself. And that's what I did in Pennsylvania for so many years. So that I promised him and myself that if we, you know, when we land in Los Angeles, there's no wasting time. Let's just get it done ourselves. When it comes to the one take aspect of it, though, what kind of comes first? Do you have a story in mind or do you have how you want to film the story in mind and it kind of like the story kind of follows on afterwards? Because the one take kind of thing, I mean, that I mean, I've I've talked to filmmakers before who have approached that type of filmmaking. That's a lot of kind of pre prep and such. It's not something just jumping uh, in the deep end on. Um, And I'm sure you know that as well. You've been a filmmaker some time working on shorts and such. Um, was that something you always wanted to try? Is it, or do you think it was just something where, you know, considering the time, considering restrictions of budget, et cetera, that this, that will be kind of like the best kind of ideal way to make the movie you want to make? I think you hit the 
long head with the ladder. I think that we knew that we didn't have much money going into this. And having that one take aspect would definitely get people to watch the film just inherently based on the structure of the film. So from there, the, the challenge came, how do we make a good one take film and how do we involve those tropes and play off those tropes to kind of trick the audience a little bit and just tell an engaging story with, you know, there's zero camera movement essentially. So how do we try to, you know, keep the audience engaged with the limitations that we have? I think what's important with Dash is that people need to realize that, yeah, it is a one take film, but it's not a, a novelty movie. You know, this is a film with a really strong story to it. Um, you wrote the screenplay, Alex Alexander Molina, who is, stars in the film as a, I think he's kind of like unnamed, he's more known as the driver or what have you. Um, yeah. But he's your producer in the film as well. His character is pretty much is is he's a really interesting guy. The first time we see him on screen, I'm not going to say what he's doing, but it's a very kind of interesting character introduction. <laughs> but um, he's this guy that's got like he's really kind of double crossing kind of life. He's got like a. Uh, uh, you know, a wife, he's got a girlfriend, he's got all these other kind of things going on. He's finding himself kind of like a, at the uh, edge of, um, you know, the bad decisions are taken to the edge of, of something, you know, to, whether it be adulthood or what have you, I, I'm not sure what it is, but but it's kind of like a really kind of interesting, but what, what's interesting about his character as well is that while he's not the most kind of, you know, um, uh, person of high character, the character himself is very kind of sympathetic, which I found kind of surprising. I think a lot of that came down to Alexander's kind of uh, performance in, in the movie. Um, writing this story, writing this guy, um, how do you know? How do you come across making this kind of this this person for for this movie? Because he's such a he's such an interesting character in so many ways. For sure, I think you know character development's incredibly challenging, especially now with people seeing everything. I think to me, a better character, a better protagonist lead, driving a story comes from somebody that isn't exactly cut and dry, good or evil. And I think we kind of see that in this character is I think he can justify in his head that what he's doing is for a good cause, but he's also harming a lot of other people along the way. I think that's kind of like Alex and I talked about that a lot throughout the whole creation of the story is that his whole existence leading up to this moment has been kind of, you know, screwing over other people, but not necessarily seeing the you know, repercussions but while doing this film in these two hours, he kind of sees his actions and, you know, the poor results from his actions come to fruition right in front of his eyes. So, I mean, it, it, it's fun. I mean, a lot of people talk about that character just because he is so kind of hit and miss. He's not entirely a terrible person, but he's also a dirtbag. So, like, where do you, do you want to root for this guy? Do you not want to? And we had a lot of fun, Alex, you know, because Alex is you know, cuts from the stage and he had a lot of questions, you know, when developing this character. And we had a lot of fun doing that and approaching it from a different way. Almost seems to me that he's kind of like a chaos personified, isn't he? Mm-hmm. 100%, absolutely. So when it comes to dealing, um, working with Alex in the film and the other actors as well, you pretty much had kind of like a month of rehearsal, right, to kind of like flesh out the characters and such. And Alex is like a theatre guy as well, isn't he? So it's kind of interesting in that you have theatre actors kind of like playing in your movie, but you need that that kind of actor, right? You can't have necessarily a film actor because theatre actors, they're up there, they're on that kind of like what they call the live wire, right? They're up there with, with no net, and you pretty much have to put them in a no net situation. Um, so that month of rehearsal, what would you say the screenplay was like beforehand as to afterwards? Was there a lot of changes to character, to 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 story, to dialogue uh, at the end of, in that rehearsal process? Mm-hmm. I mean, because, you know, I, I don't necessarily come from a theater background, but the people that we had involved did. So I got to learn about how they rehearse and how they go about doing productions. And from that rehearsal process and just going through every single beat and every possible scenario where something could go wrong or we could miss the stoplight, Alex and I go back and forth exactly how much of the script is, you know, on the screen, but it's over 90% is on the screen. And if anything is added, it's because, you know, we did hit an extra stoplight, and we, but we plan for that. So they know exactly there could be a 30 second window here where you might have to ad lib a little bit. And it just comes out in rehearsal and just these wonderful actors that were involved. Los Angeles is not necessarily your backyard. I mean, you were born and raised in Pennsylvania, I'm pretty sure. You spent time in New York City. Um, so LA was kind of like a new kind of like territory for you. Do you, How do you know where to go, where not to go in regards to the, the routes, to the, the driving? I mean, do you, are you and Alex like driving around a lot? So I was thinking to yourself, look, we can go here, we can go there, over here, not so much traffic, et cetera. And also, considering it's COVID time, would there have been a lot of kind of like vehicles on the road? I'm not really sure what the experience would have been like in regards to that. 
It's really funny you mention that because, I mean, I wrote this script essentially on my drive out to California to move here. And originally in the script, they were going to Beverly Hills. They were going to Santa Monica. They were going all over the place. And then, you know, when we did the first test, we realized that they can pretty much go two blocks off of Hollywood Boulevard. And that's about it. So mm. it was a real wake up call. But we did spend a lot of time, you know, just driving, seeing where that, you know, the certain scenes could take us and how much leeway we had. And we would find cinematically the most, you know, fitting mood and tone that we could match that, you know, tone of that scene. But uh and I'm sorry, the second question was, one more time, I apologize. Just in regards to the, the route itself, I mean, do you guys drive around for a while? Do you guys figure out where to go, where not to go? I mean, because you know, like I said, LA is not your backyard, so I'm sure you have to really kind of like uh, climatize yourself to, to Los Angeles yeah. as a city. Yeah, oh yeah, so there's a lot of just trial and error, but you, you did mention COVID. So that was kind of another reason why yeah. we chose to do it, you know, the way we did is, the streets were essentially barren. There was nobody out and about. The bars were all shut down. We, I mean, it was beautiful. There was no traffic. It was awesome. But the weekend that we started shooting, we shot for three straight consecutive nights. The weekend that we started shooting after rehearsing and planning this route for months, you know, essentially Alex and I, uh, the bars in Los Angeles reopened that weekend. So that kind of through a massive curveball for the whole production. Not, we didn't have to reroute the entire route, but I mean, timing for each individual scene changed by just that much where if we kind of played it out the way that we would have, it wouldn't have worked out. There would have been a lot of lulls and a lot of lagging behind. So we did have to readjust last minute. Just one of those things, you know, filmmaking and Murphy's Law, anything that can go wrong will. And that's kind of, but we, put, we pushed through, you know, and it worked out as well as we could, possibly could have imagined. The Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast is brought to you by Tee Public. Tee Public is the world's largest marketplace for independent creators to sell their work on the highest quality merchandise. With over 1.2 million designs, Tee Public is sure to have something you will love. The Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast is brought to you by Amazon, the world's leading online store. Amazon is your first stop to buy a wide range of products at competitive prices with fast delivery times. Amazon is also a world-class entertainment hub that includes Prime Video, Audible, Twitch, Amazon Music, and more. Sign up with Amazon today and experience the best in online shopping and entertainment. Please support Matt's movie reviews on Patreon. Get access to exclusive content, request movie reviews and top 10 lists, and help support my work. Please click on the Patreon link in the description below. So you got three nights in Los Angeles to put this all together. Alex is in the car. Um, you have your sound guy, he's mic'd up the car, you've got the camera. Where are you at this moment? Are you in a car nearby? Are you in a vicinity where you can kind of like see what's going on? I mean, do you have a signal from the camera yourself coming, a feeding to you? How does that all kind of work? So I was the casting crew. We already had it all rigged up with microphones and lighting. And then we had a, a wireless monitor hooked up and I was in a lead car. So we were, you know, roughly 50 yards ahead of Alex at all times. Uh, so I, I did have a screen and I could give him direction because he had an earpiece in as well. So he could, you know, if I have a, had a note or, you know, wanted to change something last minute, he could hear us and we did have communication. Uh, there was only a couple moments throughout that that we did lose communication because of the way. We also had a tail car that was picking up actors as we dropped them off. And it was a logistical feat, if anything. And uh, just like I said, rehearsal and practice, that's kind of what made this happen. And our wonderful stage manager, Liz, she just she comes from that theater background and she could just pull this off so, so well. Los Angeles is kind of known for uh, it being a quite an unpredictable place because of the characters in the city. Um, when yeah. filming like that and you're out there amongst the people, even during COVID time, do you still get, come across your fair share of nutters out there? That's funny because I do see them on a daily basis uh, on my normal walk to my car. But surprisingly, no, I think I think in that it comes from us rehearsing the route. We kind of strategically tried to avoid those areas where we knew people like that would be or, you know, loud, rowdy people outside of bars. We did try to avoid that. And I don't think we really had anything besides the one night that you saw in the film, the one that we used, my character forgot his AirPods. And that's because mm. one of the crazies was trying to walk on scene and I was trying to push him off <laughs> as I entered the vehicle. And I forgot my AirPods and had to add those in digitally after the fact. But that's that's about it. I wanted to talk about one word that comes up in a consistent basis throughout the movie, frazzled. 
any uh, any ideas of maybe making the dash uh, drinking game uh, in the future for uh, oh, fun. That, <laughs> I actually like that a lot. I might steal that. That's great. That's really funny. With that use of the word frazzled throughout the throughout the film, is that something that kind of comes up organically, or do you know when making the the, the screenplay, that's a really good kind of thing to kind of like link all these kind of characters together? It came from a simple conversation I was having with a friend, and somebody said, "Why are you so frazzled?" He's like, "What the fuck does frazzled even mean?" <laughs> and I think it was kind of fun, you know, throughout the story when you see him, you know, his intensity and his tension increase to kind of build up. He's like, "What? I'm not frazzled." So that was kind of just an inside little tiny joke where the audience is in on it, and they, you know, every time somebody says that to him, it's yeah, you know, it gets funnier, hopefully funnier and funnier. It does actually because every time it kind of it comes up, he has to kind of uh, as he finds himself in more states of duress throughout the film. He needs to really swallow his tongue and then and, and try to put on a a, a, a certain uh, sane front. And uh, yeah, it's it's really, it's really interesting. Um, I wanted to talk about post production wise because something that's uh, really cool about this movie is the use of kind of like animations and like graphics. Because a lot, of course, he's a ride share driver, but a lot of kind of like conversations are done with text email etc uh phone calls etc and all that kind of stuff what's that experience like for you because i imagine doing the post-production i mean you got the the raw footage you got your take but adding that stuff to is that like a something a new experience for you to kind of delve into that kind of world of animations and graphics for sure that's one of my favorite things to do actually i really enjoy doing you know after effects title animation and object removal and stuff like that so to me that was actually a lot of fun you know there, like i said there actually isn't any cuts so I had the, you know, we had no excuse to have a perfect frame. So I did have to go through essentially frame by frame and make sure everything looked up to par because like I said, we had no excuse. And the only main issue I think we had is his hands were, mm-hmm. you know, really close to the light that we had set up. So I did have to go through the entire movie and rotoscope around his hands and make and adjust the exposure to bring it back down to make it more pleasant. But no, I really enjoyed that process besides doing all of my editing on a 2008 Cheese Grater Mac Pro that I would not recommend. Uh, but no, I, I really enjoyed a lot of it. I've talked to filmmakers a lot in regards to kind of like the post-production pro- process, especially independent filmmakers in the number of stories I have where laptops have crashed and you know hard drives have gone missing and stuff like that. What I find really interesting, and, and it's something I think that I have gone through as well, is that a lot of the times I learn just by doing. I mean, you're not going to get it right the first time. We're going to go over and over and over. Um, is that pretty much how you learn kind of like your craft as well in regards to editing and kind of like the post-production stuff? Did you just learn just by like jumping in and doing it? or Because I know that I, I remember I heard in an interview that you kind of went to filmmaking school, but the, they were really talking about old school kind of tech. They're still talking about cutting film and stuff. And you're like, you know, that's great and all, but this is a new era. This is a new time. We're making film movies on these little things now. You know, Soderbergh's making movies on his iPhone now. We need to learn that stuff. He's, and so you pretty much left that and uh, that and, and you said, I, I think I need to just uh, go to my own kind of school of uh, uh, like DIY school school to learn a lot of this stuff. You're exactly right. I mean, you, like exactly like you said, a lot of those professors were still cutting on film and learning these editing softwares, whether it be Premiere or After Effects. The same time the students were, and it kind of seemed redundant to be in the same classes that they were essentially learning at the same time. So, you know, I, I did come from that background, and this is you know when I was growing up, YouTube was really prominent. So any problem you did have, you could try to find a similar issue and find a tutorial along those ways. And all of the problems that it came from, you know, 10 years of shooting in Western Pennsylvania with nobody else around, you kind of just, you see everything that can happen and you know how to fix it and know that it is, you know, fixable. So like, I think yeah, coming from that YouTube university and just kind of like doing it and experiencing it, knowing how you messed up, but knowing how to fix it just was a tremendous help throughout my entire filmmaking career and especially this project. I always say that um, I don't know if I'm doing that the right way, but I know I'm doing it my way. You know, and I think my, and, and you just have to kind of almost kind of personalize it, right? You got to make it you just work for you. Because now living in Los Angeles, I am getting more editing work and seeing how the professionals lump in their projects. Like, oh wow, I would never do it like that, but that makes more sense. So you're exactly right. There is not there's more than one way for sure. Um, and the other part of this process was interesting is um that of distribution. It's one thing to make a film. It's another film to get a film out, get out there. And it's kind of funny how COVID kind of, you know, almost kind of like, and it's kind of weird to say considering the tragic circumstances behind COVID, but it was all, almost kind of like a, a form of almost lady luck for you because you had a, a situation where you're sending out kind of press releases and, and some people getting screeners and you were getting offers here and there from different people. 
And then um, uh, someone from XYZ Films gets in touch with you and they manage to see your screener because they're in Tribeca. They get COVID. They can't go to any screenings, but they got your screener and they're watching it in a hotel room. And like, we got to get this film. It's kind of uh, almost kind of like a uh, uh, fatus kind of of, uh, thing that's going on there, don't you think? I'm still blown away. It still doesn't seem entirely real to me just because of who they are. And you know, I you know spent 10 years, you know, getting turned down by everybody possibly involved in the industry. So to have that one final lucky yes is just so surreal. And I couldn't be more grateful that it, I'm glad I'm glad he's okay. But James did get COVID and he, he wasn't able to attend Tribeca and he could watch our film. And it just, uh, it's, it seems like fate. You're right. And I couldn't be more thankful and just grateful that it happened. Now that the film is out there and people are going to watch it, I think a lot of people like myself are going to have a really kind of like strong reaction to it, especially in the positive. Um, what's happening with you now in regards to uh, future projects? I know I, I read you were saying that um, I know you love horror, that you had like a horror script you're working on for a little while now. Do you think something like, I mean, in Dash does kind of at times kind of delves into those elements a bit. It's not necessarily a horror film, but it can kind of get a little gritty there. Um, is uh, horror something that you're looking to do next with your next project or are you just going to work on uh, editing for now and uh, and see where that goes? I, I love the horror so much. That's how yeah, I mentioned 10 years a lot, but I spent most of those 10 years making horror shorts in hopes of making a horror feature. So it's a genre that's very near and dear to me. I think for the next project specifically, it'll probably be a little bit more tonally similar to Dash, more of a thriller comedic kind of vibe. Uh, but in the n- near, near future, I would love to tackle the horror genre just because the fans are so great. And if they don't like it, they're more than happy to tell you. And <laughs> it's such a challenging genre to do well. And I, yeah. I embrace, I've always wanted that challenge. And those are the guys that inspired me. So I would love to make a horror film in the very near future for sure. And something that's challenging to do is the, the whole, the, the one take film. I mean, so I've seen a, a bunch of them and some of them work. In some work in kind of like a like a technical kind of aspect, like you're really kind of blown away by like how it's kind of pieced together, but the story isn't there. But we've dashed the stories then. I think that's really kind of important. And I don't know about you, but when I'm watching the film, I don't know if you have reactions from other people as well. I kind of forget that I'm watching a one-take film because I'm so engrossed with the movie. And I'm sure that's something that's so successful in regards to why people are positive about it. Do you have you heard reactions like that as well? Where people kind of forget about the the how the film is made and more kind of like in first and two, how does the film is told? Thank you for saying that, by the way. But I think, you know, even when we wrapped, I think we both had kind of you know, imposter syndrome where it's like we wrapped this film, but can people get behind this? You know, I think the trailer does a little bit better, you know, to like show what it can be, but, you know, will an audience be willing to sit down and watch a film with no camera movement in one location? And uh, to me, like that was the whole point of this entire film was to prove that that's it doesn't take millions and millions of dollars. It just takes a good story to kind of make a good film. And to me, that's what I'm most proud of is the fact that, you know, people are willing to and people do get lost and forget about, oh, wow, there's not camera moving. There's no cuts like people get lost in that moment. So like to me, that's the most exciting part about this whole project is, is that people are and have. And I haven't talked to anybody yet. I'm sure there will be people that are like, no, this is ridiculous. I'm not going to sit and stare at a car for an hour and a half. But so far, so good, I guess. I mean, I I really love Dash. I really do. It's been, I, I can definitely say it's one of my favorite films of the year. And it's, it's, it's so good to be like near the end of the year and and still come across movies like Dash. And, and I really recommend to everyone out there, November 29, digital and video on demand, Watch Dash. Um, I really like and and just be prepared as well when, when watching it because this this movie's going to take you to places you're not going to expect. But that's what's really cool about it as well. It's kind of like it got this uh, kind of vibe to us, like you don't know what's coming around the corner. Um, and when it does, it kind of really hits you for a loop, and then the other corner is going to come as well. And then you know, it's going <laughs> to take you to it for a ride somewhere else. So I got to say, Sean Perry, man, congratulations in, with the film. It's been it's it's really fantastic, and the the way that it, you came about making it, and and how it's all pieced together, and how it's presented, is just really fantastic. And so, congrats to you, and also give my congrats to Alexander as well for his performance. His performance is really fantastic in the film. Um, for everyone out there listening, please watch Dash, November twenty nine, digital. Video on demand, watch it, talk about it, get people talking about this film. It's it's really fantastic. So thank you, Sean, for your time. Hopefully uh, we could talk again in the future. It's been a pleasure. I would love that. Thank you for the kind words. My heart is filled. Thank you so, so much for everything. I really appreciate it. I'm glad you enjoyed the film. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews, podcast interviews, and exclusive content. Also, 
If you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.